This show may contain strong language and adult themes. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 22 Dropout, your favourite podcast and YouTube show, talking about all things you know, sort of around rugby. Um, we are a little bit depleted tonight through a few things, and it is, it's Sammy's birthday tonight. Sam is, decided, well, it's not his birthday tonight, it's his birthday at the weekend, and he's had a great big party over in Gozo, and he basically couldn't be asked to, to go back home and join us. So, uh, Could have joined us from Gozo. Sam. He could have done, and I was going to say, let's sing Sam happy birthday, let's raise a glass to Sam and say happy birthday, but fuck off. He can't be I've got, a bit, come I've on. got a better idea. He ought to be publicly shit on, he ought to be publicly shot, he ought to be left in a West Country shite house and left there to fucking well rot. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of West Country shite houses, um, Tom, how is Gloucester? <laughs> well, I'm still, I'm still not made, been able to make my way back over there just yet, so I'm still in uh, not so sunny Kent. Um, but soon I'll be heading back over to the West Country, back over to Gloucester, and seeing what chaos has been caused while I've been away. What chaos do you think could have been caused while you're away, Tom? Well, at the rugby club, there's certain chaos that's going on at the moment, which I'm sure we will discuss. Um, oh. with a certain someone <laughs> being slotted in and all the Gloucester not so faithful it seems at the moment getting a little bit pissed off uh, anyway um, James has already interfered tonight um, right <laughs> off the back so I've now got to put one of those lovely little warnings about bad language on at the beginning of this uh, although I think I did go there first with the F you did <laughs> I did yeah so how's things up in the, in sunny Scotland then James what sun? It's been absolutely tipping it down up here in Inverness today. Might be a bit dreek at the moment, though, to use a Scottish word. You need Sam to interpret that for you. <laughs> hey, there is one good thing. There is one good thing about Sam not being here, and that's we don't need bloody subtitles at the bottom of the screen whenever he talks <laughs> anymore. So uh, let's see how the internet's faring up over in Kenya then as to whether we have to spend three days waiting for for poor old Lawrence to reply. How are you doing, man? <laughs> yeah, I'm keeping well, Michael. Good. And what's new with you over there? Um, nothing really new, but uh, what I can see is the weather is really nice, maybe. <laughs> Don't Listen, rub man. it in. Don't rub it in, all right? There's one <laughs> thing the British hate most. It's people talking about our bloody weather. That's how it go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I see that the barber shops still haven't opened over there, have they? I mean, yeah, they, they, they are not going to, and even if they open, I'm not going to visit there anytime soon. I think what you need to do is put some millet or something in your hair and let your hens peck it. <laughs> maybe you do a, a very natural haircut. He does not want oh, a big on, a cock on his head. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There you go, there it is. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, where my screen is right now, the big cock is on Lawrence's head. It so is. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's yeah, touch me. upon the um, the Gloucester issue then, uh, uh, Tom. Yeah, so um, obviously Gloucester announced this week that George um, Skivington has been announced as their new head coach. My rumour um, last week. It was your rumour, James, yeah. <laughs> we all didn't really believe him. <laughs> Look how happy he is. Look at his little stuff. face. Yeah, but that's the first rumour that's ever been right. Uh, yeah, he's... Uh, yeah, well, he is. Uh, hey, well, listen, we've got the other rumour that Eddie Jones is going to Australia on a coach swap. <laughs> uh, and we're still waiting for that one to see if it's come true. Although, next week, Anthony Petrie should be with us again. Um, it's a very special show next week that we'll talk about later on uh, that you must join us for. Uh, so Anthony will be on, and I'm sure he's going to come up with the world's worst bullshit as to why it's not happened yet, and just tell us that it's <laughs> a work in progress. Um, so go on, Tom, carry on, man. Yeah, so uh, George is, uh, the, was an assistant coach at London Irish, 
Um, he's now moved over, obviously, to become head coach of Gloucester. No head coach experience, really, at a top-flight team or in the, or in the Premiership at all. Um, so it's creating a bit of a worry for Gloucester fans. The potential coaching talent that was on offer to Gloucester to take up has clearly not been, that, and they seem to have gone with what Gloucester fans feel is the, the cheap option, basically, which may be wise in the current pandemic. Oh, OK, so um, what was the talent that was on offer? Were they actually on offer, or was this just like a pile of rumours again, and when they looked at maybe the financials or whatever, they mm. just didn't want to go for it? Well, again, it's, it's all believed. They haven't actually announced the list of people that applied for the job. Um, I doubt that they would. Um, but, you know, there's certain people that are milling around. Michael Checker obviously was, was known to be about. Various other um, coaches. Cockrell was thought to, you know, that would be his way back into the Premiership. But it seems that it's not going to be the way at the moment. Um, the argument as well is obviously that Gloucester are, are still happy to throw their money about a bit with their big signing recently, obviously, of Johnny May. So why are they throwing it around for, you know, a key player, maybe as a winger, but then sort of getting back on the, on the coaches, perhaps. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, as I say, there's a lot worse coming because Irish are saying that they've not been approached and asked. <laughs> that said, um, I don't believe that Michael Checker was ever going to, uh, to go to Gloucester because, of course, he's been linked to Bézier and, uh, and a few other places. Uh, and talking to Bézier, as we did last week, um, that, uh, that takeover looks, uh, looks well in motion now. But interestingly, the guy who is there or was their majority shareholder and has been backing them and sponsoring them for the last 20 years, he said that he wanted to look at revitalising the forms of the club and putting a new bid together. But uh, he's pulled out. Uh, and the reason that he has cited for pulling out is that uh, when he said this, he, he started getting uh, a lot of threats. You, you start sticking um, millions and millions and millions of euros into, uh, into play a, a D2 team like Bézier. It, this could be a real game changer for French rugby. Yeah, yeah it'd be interesting to see, I think, what really happens there and how they try and, try and improve on things and bring things up. Um, the, the chance of getting through those leagues, I mean, the, the D2 leagues and stuff in France are, are a lot more televised. They're generally sort of held in a higher regard than it is, for example, in the championship over here in England. Um, and even some championships are really trying to push more and more now. Uh, I saw an article today about Charlie Walker, the ex-Harlequin, went over to France for a couple of years and is now um, moving to Ealing Trail Finders. And uh, he's speaking about how it's their intent to get back into, or to get into the Premiership rather, um, to really, really push and, and push up and try and, Challenge whoever comes down. Um, doubt they were to challenge this season with uh, with with Saris being the one that's come down. But I'm you never know so what they sure, might try know. and push for. I'm not so sure. I think people like Ealing, especially, will see Saris as a scalp that they want to capture. Yeah, they'll they'll want to get him. They'll want to get him. I would. Yeah. If absolutely. I was if yeah. I was still playing, I I'd want to slot one or two of the bigger so called big names and say, let's see what real rugby's like, pal. Well, this is the, the like game when, I'm looking forward to probably well, the most is when uh, when Saris have to come down to Hartbury, where I reckon the whole of the shed from King's Home will just pop across the road, 10 minutes down the road, to Hartbury, and will be filling the place out to berate the Saris team as they come out and play. I'm sure they will. So I'm looking forward to that greatly. Now, you talk about, uh, about Saris as well. Um, so last week, I think it was last week, we said about uh, Barrett was uh, linked with a move to Bézier as well. And everybody said, no, he's staying at Saracens. Well, uh, Saracens have confirmed now that he is actually leaving. Uh, Barrett's confirmed that he's leaving as well. Um, but there's no news yet on where he's going. So, uh, you know, watch this space. He could well, he could well end up in, uh, in Bézier uh, if he's going for the money. Mm. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how, how they try and attract and draw people to the club, whether it is just a load of influx of money and come for us because we're expensive or if they're going to have a real sort of, I don't know, if you kind of a, a position push towards pushing right the way through or whether they just chuck a load of money at it and hope it works. Um, you need to sort yeah. of have the right management in place to make sure that a club like that works because you can chuck as much money at rugby clubs as you like. 
if it's not done the right way and it's not done by someone with a rugby brain, it's going to go absolutely nowhere and you're going to be in the drain with all your cash. And what's the transfer news over in Kenya? Do you have these, these problems with everybody wanting to pop across the water to Sri Lanka? <laughs> not yet, actually, but only the probably trending news right now in Kenya is that uh, the immediate former Kenya Sevens coach, Paul Feni, a New Zealander, um, has left his job, or rather Kenya rugby are not, are not in a position to pay him, um, considering the unprecedented times you're in. So they're still in search of a um, new coach, and luckily I've applied to be one. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see that now. <laughs> running out, running out with the team I, I, through the I, tunnel I, in Dubai is little Lawrence coming out as the coach for seven. <laughs> That'd be ace. I, 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 any of those Kenyans, they're like this tall. Yeah. <laughs> Except Lawrence, who's about this tall. Um, well, you know, you talk about the championship. It's it's interesting because there was uh, there's been a couple of stories uh, recently about uh, and we talked about it last week, didn't we, about the A League uh, yeah. and whether we should bring that back. And actually, lots of people have said, to be honest, nobody wants to go and watch on a Monday night, especially when you you look at some of the teams and when they put their A Leagues out. There's only half of the squad that are actually on the books, and they borrow the other half from usually a championship club as well. A lot of people were talking about let's make the championship uh, a, a better, more interesting thing uh, league, like mm. you were saying, Tom. Uh, and instead of so the, there have been occasions, for example, Quinns are using an example, sending some guys down to London Scottish uh, over the season, and they would go down knowing they not got a game that week. They would go and do a couple of days training, do the game. Well, I'm sorry, it's Premiership Cup the weekend after, so we're having the back. And it was meaningless for, for the club, and it's certainly not much more than meaningless for the players. It just keeps the body moving, really. But other clubs who are supporting championship clubs with long-term loans for three, four months or more, well, everybody benefits then. Uh, and I think yeah. we might be coming to that point where you've, uh, you, you almost have... Uh, a buddy system between a premiership club and a championship club, and they saw the work together. Um, mm. I, I don't know what your feelings are on that, whether that's something you think will happen, whether it'll end up the premiership sides alone. Yeah. In the future. I mean, it, it's very interesting you say that, really, Mike, because um, something that, that's happened this past season in the, the women's premiership um, is that they've now cancelled the, the RFU said you are no longer allowed as a premiership club, you're no longer allowed a uh, development side. So they all had development teams often playing sort of the, how you, clubs used to play. Clubs used to play their first team and their second team. They both travel over on the coach and play the first team, second team, the other mm. team and so on. And that's essentially what they were doing in the uh, women's premiership is that they were going along and taking their, sec their development team, their second team, and playing against the other premiership club's development team as well. But that's now been scrapped. There's no league for the development teams, not allowed to have a development team anymore. Um, and what it's led to is various range of scenarios that some clubs have decided to actually partner with uh, championship sides, um, which is, is threatening for championship rugby in some ways in the fact that they don't want to overload with players. Um, Hartbury have announced that they are joining up with Cheltenham uh, Tigers and the women's championship side. So it'll be interesting to see how they work that relationship. Um, but then there are other clubs that are literally having a, a whole team in another rugby club. And they are just going to literally plough that whole team from, from fresh, from new, with their own development players and train together and everything else. So it'd be really interesting to see how the women's premiership works it. Um, and then maybe the men could take a lesson from the women for once. It's been done before, though. They, they did this before. I mean, I remember when Sale moved from Haywood Road to uh, the new ground and the, the uh, development side invariably came from Sale FC players or from Echoes Rugby Club or from all the other uh, higher level clubs round and about. Sandbach in particular. I mean, in, uh, a good few years ago when James Gaskell and Liam Malik and, and uh, Will Cliff and co all came through, I think there was about 10 sandbag lads all went to sale. Uh, now, some of them have gone on and had really good careers. As a year group, it killed sandbag. That particular year group 
they had a squad of about 26 players. They all went through into, into pro or semi-pro rugby and it killed Sandbach for a year group. I could see that happening to, to other clubs. I mean, if it, let, let's put this into context. If that happened to somebody like Wolverhampton, it would devastate him. It would kill them. How does it work over in Kenya, uh, Lawrence? Obviously a very, very different situation over there. Um, what happens uh, in terms of development? Do you know those top teams, do they have their own sort of development squads or do they just go and pick wherever they like? We're not uh, that developed uh, in terms of rugby as can compare to England maybe. Uh, but there are some certain clubs which have uh, the development squad with them. And uh, also there are some clubs which now, or rather they mostly, mostly rely on uh, guys who finished college, high school students who are just uh, finished their school. Because that's the that, like that's the only way they can be able to tap now these young talents into their squads. Really, I, I around only five five less than five clubs have the develop development squads. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, no. Um, it, it just shows it shows the vast difference, though, doesn't it? What you know, things that we're talking about, things that we're used to, um, and that. The, they're almost the, the thing of dreams, even though that we're criticising them. Um, they're the sort of the thing of dreams uh, for, for places like Kenya, aren't they? I, I mean, really? yeah. We can put yes, that into yes, context yes. though, Mike. So when I first started playing back in the 70s, I went to Warrington Rugby Union Club. On a Saturday, they were putting out five senior sides, plus a vet side, plus a cult side. Now they're struggling to get three out. Now, of course, they're getting the kids out on a Sunday. So they have under 19s and under 17s, which effectively would have just been one one. Uh, cult yeah, side. It would have been bad then. Senior players in in the UK, there is a lack of them. The, the older guys are just drifting away from the game, and the youngsters are going to university and not continuing with the game. Yeah, this is why we've had things like the the keep your boots on program for a couple of years, isn't it, Tom? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's trying to get people back involved in in various different ways, obviously in the game. Um, and it's it's sort of been successful, I suppose, in trying to increase the refereeing and stuff, for example. Um, and there are lots more ways to be involved at university as well now. So when they go to university, you don't have to just play rugby. You can be involved in, in refereeing. As I say for myself, I'm, I'm, on, I'm at university on a part scholarship for, for refereeing. So there, there, is, there are opportunities out there for people to actually get more help with it at college and at university. But... It's such a difficult thing when, as you were talking about, James, clubs, when they build up their strong youth sections, but actually all of them disappear, bar a few. And um, sometimes it's a few that you may need, but sometimes none of them will stay. And I think from my age group, I think none stayed around. Everyone went to university. Um, actually, as a rugby club, you kind of hope your kids are not that clever. Um, so they stick around. Yeah, it's, it's um, always the top one, isn't it? <laughs> How do you feed into your adult... I mean, what I'd like to see is when these kids go away, when they go into the professional, semi-professional game, is that when they get to the 29, 30, 31, where they're not getting the professional contracts anymore, go back to where it started from. Go put something back in to your junior club. You don't see yeah, it very if, often. Even if it's not where you're living at the moment. So you could have, you could have grown up in the northeast, yeah, absolutely, at Gloucester. But you know, you're going to have or easily make some ties with some friends at a, an amateur club around the area. Um, you know, you might as well. The, the game's been good to you, but and you are amongst that elite. You know, millions of people have these dreams. Uh, and it's only a very, very small few who ever get to realise them. Like it or not, they are the heroes of, of, of many folk. But you talk about uh, sort of guys who are 29 and things like that. I think this pandemic has, has seen a massive shrink in, in squad sizes. Because again, another, another player is leaving Saints. This time it's Jamie Gibson, one of their flankers. Um, and there's a lot of people who are leaving clubs and not finding jobs in rugby. They're not moving on to other clubs. The opportunities this season certainly are not there. And uh, when we come back after the break and we meet tonight's guest, we will look at, uh, at how this affects players uh, because that's exactly what's happened to tonight's guest as well. Um, it, it'll affect the mental health more than anything because they've been used will. to having everything on a plate for them. So they turn up at training, 
they're told what to do very much like being in the military you, you you turn up you're told what to do you get on with it you go home you have a few beers you relax you do the same the next day and so on and so forth it becomes a habit the best way to help them and help the mental health is get them back involved in the junior clubs whether it's in a coaching role whether it's in a, a playing role but they need to give something back to the junior clubs that put them there in the first place so how does that have- do you have the same sort of thing over in Kenya, Lauren? You know, with with the amateur teams. Do when the, those players finish. I know they've all got jobs anyway because there's no truly um, professional contract out there. They're all semi-pro or paid to play. Um, do you see a lot of your top stars and guys who've been on the World Series in sevens? Do they go back to uh, their amateur clubs? Just an honest answer. Only say around ten percent normally go back and. Uh, give back to the community as James is alluding now. I think probably it can be made mandatory for any senior chap who's um, maybe a legend to all these youngsters that are coming in. to Just go back to the rugby clubs around them. It doesn't necessarily mean where the club that, that he's playing for because there are so many rugby clubs around. Uh, so they just go there even if it means to coach the young kids. Even just a motivational talk with them, I think it can help them also for them to to, to achieve their dreams, to achieve their goals. When those those players are starting to get to the end of their careers and they're looking at the next option, the next thing that they can move on to and for example, a lot of players look at going into coaching. Um, and what typically happens is rather than going into a grassroots club and helping out, a, you know, I don't know, an under-16s, a Colts team, something like that, they get pumped straight into coaching with their academy or in their DPP setups. Really, it gives them a bit of an artificial view of, of, of rugby in that sense, in that everyone at that age is not as switched on and wants to be there as much as the kids do at the DPP and the academy because they are the very select few. Um, and it also means that new new coaches have a little bit more of a barrier to get through because they've had to start at the very bottom and the, the players have already got that extra. They've got the connections for a start and then they've yeah. also got that, that next uh, added bonus of already starting at a higher level. So by the time you've worked up to DVP Academy as a, as a regular coach, if you're trying to push on with your career, someone else is already a pro player that's maybe finishing off is already going up because they've been able to jump straight from that level. And uh, it's a very difficult balance to get there as well, I think. Yeah, you've yeah, got to look at, at all around the premiership and, and even a bit below. Uh, and you, you go uh, and look at those coaches. How many of the coaches are uh, guys who've just started the coaching career maybe because of kids or whatever and gone through to the professional game they're almost all ex-players at the top end of the game yeah and Even it's d- understandable of course it is but it's just it's uh it's difficult sometimes when as you're going as a coach and you are usually asked or well, well, what level did you play to you know from the players there's an expectation that you're going to be a better coach because you played at a certain level and Actually, yeah, some of them are way better because they've been coaching for that whole time. They've had the experiences, they've learned the lessons and they are at the level now where they can fully understand. Stuart Lancaster didn't uh, play at a uh, particularly high level, but he's not a bad coach. Yeah, well, well, he exactly. was. Yeah. Well, so, he, is, the, the, he is again now. He is again now. With left, yeah, he was with, crap uh, when he was so. in England. But <laughs> did, did you know to say <laughs> nobody backed you up there, mate? <laughs> and on that bombshell, we're going to go and we're going to take a, a short break. Uh, we'll be back with you with our special guest tonight right after this. When you need clear and concise match official communication systems, Look no further than the brand new AxiWe AT350. Radios are always that they're always useful, they always help us, especially the AxiWe's where all three of us can be open at any time, we can have open communication. Available now from refcomsglobal.net. Invest in profits into match official development worldwide. Welcome back to part two of the 22 dropouts. It's slightly deleted 22 tonight. Uh, we're still not saying happy birthday to that fucking idiot over in Malta who won't be bothering to join us tonight uh, because he's too busy getting fished. Uh, but we are really grateful that we're joined tonight by the wonderful uh, Oliver Stebbins. Say hello, buddy. Hi, guys. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Now, <laughs> uh, if only you knew what we'd been talking about before. Uh, but anyway, um, oh, just before the break, we were talking about uh, A-League Championship, how that fits in with the Premiership and all of that sort of stuff. What's your take on that as being somebody who's, uh, who's sort of been through that quite recently? Yeah, well, I think yeah, the whole A-League setup is a really interesting one. Um, I'm trying to think back when I first started playing A-League, you'd, you'd have a sort of mixture of teams where you get the sort of traditional teams that were um, just 18, 19, 20-year-olds. Um, you'd get the teams where there'd be a mixture of players. They'd also get in some ringers from other clubs just filling numbers. And then you get the sides like Leicester and uh, Harlequins that I remember playing against where it's practically a full international side at times. Um, so I think it's a very difficult situation for, for Premiership clubs to navigate. However, saying that, um, I think playing competitive rugby at a young age, especially those sort of early years of sort of professional career, 18, 19, 20, is absolutely paramount. And do I believe all the A-League sides go in there looking to win and looking to to sort of get the best what they can and win the competition? No, I don't think they do. I think a lot of A-Leagues are set up so two or three lads get a chance to play and the other sort of 10 or 12 are sort of there to, um, to make up the numbers, as it were. Um, I would, I would, with the Championship, I think, um, I think the sort of link between two clubs, I've seen Bedford and Northampton have just done that. And yep. for a club like Bedford, that would be really useful. I know they're on a small budget. Um, and, and getting that link um, would be very vital for them and also for Northampton to send out their sort of that sort of transitional age from 18 to sort of 21, 22, give the boys some competitive rugby. And the championship's a tough breeding ground for a lot of players. I've seen, seen players who've gone on to do well in their careers and especially sort of young front rowers. Uh, they've gone on to have international caps and they've sort of learned the hard way in the championship. And I think um, the more players are exposed to the championship uh, and sort of men's rugby, I think the better for the, for the game. Yeah, I suppose it, it depends on how it's done, really. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, when I watched the A-League uh, at, at Henley with Wasp, I, it's 15, 16 years ago now. And it was, a, it was a much different competition to the one that we see today. Uh, and, and so I, I, I'm not really comparing apples with apples, unfortunately. Mm. Um, I, I certainly see the benefit of having a really, really good second-tier competition like they do in France. Um, and that is the feeder almost yeah. to uh, to the elite clubs rather than this this ad hoc sort of um, uh, academy state where you take as many people uh, as you can just so that nobody else can help them and then their hopes are dashed a, a few months later or a few years later yeah i think the academy system whilst for the elite the very elite kids that come out of it it works perfectly I think the sort of generation who aren't ready to step into Premiership Rugby at 18, 19, 20, uh, I think, especially when I was younger, those sort of guys got left behind. I know they're working a lot harder to keep guys on. They keep guys on academy contracts till 22, 23 to give them that chance to progress. Um, but like you say in France, I mean, it, it's a different, it's slightly different over there because I think rugby is a lot bigger sport. The second tier is supported massively. Big grounds, big, sta uh, big attendances and what have you. Um, but I think having a having a, a strong championship is so vital. Um, I, I, obviously, the recent progressions of cutting championship funding. Then you look at the England team, where I think 15, 16, 17 have played in the championship at some stage. Um, they didn't come out of the academy at 18, or well, maybe one or two did, but at 18 and were able to play international rugby straight away. They had to learn somewhere. And I think a competitive championship, a properly funded championship, is um, is a very very important thing. Yeah, it did strike me as a bit of an odd decision, that, um, and a very yeah. odd statement to make. Um, I, I, I don't think we give enough store, really, to the Championship in this country, and I think it's about time that changed. I saw they looked down their noses, in my opinion, on the Championship, but then you look at clubs like Bristol, it took them 10 years to come back up, or the best part of. Um, yeah. They stacked, stacked a squad countless times over with superstars in internationals and, and didn't get it right until Pat Lamb came in. So... It shows how competitive the league is. Very rarely does a team go unbeaten. I know Falcons did this season, but London Irish had some scrapes. Worcester had, had to spend two years down. As I said, Bristol spent a long while down. So I think looking down their nose at the championship is, is a very dangerous thing to do because it's, 
it's sent a lot of players further forward up in the Premiership and, and further on into international rugby. Well, there's no guarantee that Sir Saris are going to come straight back up, is there? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it'd be interesting. Obviously, I, I, I've got no doubt that Saracens will win the league. Um, however, will it be plain sailing 50 nillers each week? I, I don't think it will be. Um, there's, there'll be a bit of a culture shock, for I think, for a few Saracens boys. Who I'm sure they'll be more than capable of of doing whatever's required. But you're not going to nice big stadiums um, like the Rico and places like you're going down to Pirates. You're going down to the wreck at London Scottish or Richmond now as well. Um, you're going to get changed in tiny changing rooms that aren't the nice, aren't, nicest, aren't the most friendly. Bit of a partisan crowd. No, they're, not, they're not that nice at Tigers either. We were talking. Oh about this yeah, last well, week. true. But when there's when there's sort of twenty thousand <laughs> shouting at you, it all kind of morphs into one. But when it's a thousand, you hear every individual sort every of every single every, one. Yeah, yeah, and you hear all the abuse you kind of get, and it's it's interesting. It's definitely a, a, a big change of scenery, which I'm sure those boys will, will cope with. But it might be yeah. a, a shock along the way. To be fair, it's the same for referees. I mean, you get shouted out when there's very few people on on the on the touch lines, mm-hmm. but you always always know when you're having a good game because you get the same crap from both sets of supporters <laughs> 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 and both benches. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing I think ball. that one thing I think would be good that with Sarri's going down to the championship this year as well is hopefully it's obviously nothing forthcoming yet, but hopefully there's going to be some sort of. Uh, TV deal. I know that Sky, there was rumours a few months ago now that Sky were interested in doing something a bit more again. Um, Because Sky used to to televise a fair bit of the championship at one time and then it sort of has really gone downscale. And um, I'm hoping that maybe with Saracens in there, knowing that Saracens have got a big fan base anyway, they might think, "Mm, actually, we might get a good bit of uh, people trying to watch these games here. Let's put some of them on. Um, So hopefully that's going to boost the league. Hopefully, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the TV thing's a, a peculiar one. Obviously, I know the Championship doesn't make um, a great deal of money, but I'm not sure how the deals are worked. I know Premier Rugby is, is its own entity, but I don't see how the RFU or the powers that be couldn't do a TV deal that, where Premiership Rugby or International Rugby is sold on the same rights that Championship Rugby is and sort of taking on Championship Rugby. I think you yeah. see now with Sky Sports and BT, um, they're taking on women's football and all these sort of different sort of avenues as well as their conventional um, premiership football, which makes them all their money. Um, I don't see why it can't be on Sky, or even like like the Welsh system, where it's on free-to-air, it's on um, BBC Scrum Web. Scrum 5. Scrum 5, yeah. yeah Scrum 5, it's, it's, it's a good show, and they do it properly, and I'm sure it doesn't make uh, S4C, it doesn't make a great deal of money, but it's good exposure for the game, even if it's run at non-profit, um, it, still, it still shows the game and allows... Uh, the game to grow, which I think it still needs to do. Uh, Ollie, you've been what eleven years now as a professional player, and um, you've just finished what is it at the moment your rugby career um, up at Doncaster? Yeah, uh, so left Doncaster in uh, in February. Um, unfortunately, got injured, and uh, powers that be decided that they should terminate my contract, um, which wasn't wasn't the best. But uh, yeah, eleven years of um, ups and downs and it's been a interesting ride and maybe a little bit more left but uh, who knows Now weren't you supposed to go for a medical for another another club this week? Yeah I'd agree to sign at um, a club in, in France I was actually supposed to fly out tomorrow which is interesting um, done the paperwork and unfortunately um, they've decided to, to pull out which is a, an interesting one as well um, but I mean rugby sort of throws these things at you and a uh, you're never really sure where what's coming and what's going, but um, a bit of a tough one to take. Bezier, they're going to have loads of money next year. <laughs> yeah, I've seen, they're yeah. recruiting hard, aren't they? Get your agent yeah. to ring Bezier up tonight. No, if, if only. I think they might be signing the, uh, the Harlem Globetrotters there with the money that might be coming in. So <laughs> there's, there's been an awful lot of rumours as to who's going there, uh, I have to say. Um, you know, and, and some of them, I actually think we'll probably end up there uh, because the, if, they, if this deal happens and they throw all that money at it, it's, uh, you know, Happy days for a lot of people because, and you know, this is not just you. We were talking about it earlier on. We've seen an awful lot of people now who are leaving rugby. This this whole pandemic thing, plus the uh, reduction in salary cap, uh, the funding cuts to the championship. The clubs just don't seem to have the money, and they're just downsizing on their squads. 
Yeah, it's, it's a really tough time. Uh, the market out there is pretty brutal. Um, and I think uh, there's a kind of gap between the sort of superstars are, are being looked after, and rightly so. Um, and then being an academy boy coming through is probably the best time there's ever been because there's opportunities there now. Um, I think clubs are sort of filling up their, their uh, squads with younger players who might be a bit cheaper um, rather than taking on the sort of experienced guys who are on maybe slightly better wages. Uh, but it's a really, really tough time for rugby. A lot of rugby clubs are struggling desperately. Uh, I'm seeing a number of sort of GoFundMe pages and trying to trying to scrape and sort of borrow every bit they can to, to keep things afloat. So um, it's a very interesting time for rugby. <laughs> It's a difficult one because uh, maybe some rugby clubs were sort of operating over and beyond their means. Um, but then the, the clubs that do have been run traditionally well and um, and stay within budgets, they're, uh, they're being hit hard as well. So it's tough. No, I, I agree with you. Now, um, it's slightly different for the guys at the top of the game. We, we know that they are supposed to act professionally. Uh, I remember those good old days of uh, club outings with Wasps and everybody was terribly professional. Um, but what's your best ever night out while you've been a rugby player with uh, with your teammates? Oh, geez, that's quite a tough one. I mean, I mean, normally the best nights out you can't remember. Um, the really, <laughs> the really good ones, there's not too much memory. Um, I think uh, the night we won won the um, we won the championship of London Welsh was a pretty good night. Um, I think the whole sort of setup in terms of going down to Bristol, we were leading in the first leg and then we were still sort of told that you're never going to do this. Bristol have got X, Y and Z and, and to win that one was a, was a pretty good one. Um, the night back, I, I don't think I slept for about two or three days after that. We were just sort of uh, straight back on the bus, straight out. We, we all met at our captain, uh, Tom May's house at nine o'clock the next morning and sort of rolled into the next day and it lasted a fair while. It was a, a pretty good one, yeah, of what I can... Well, I grew up, Not right. quite Alex Goode, though. You didn't go no. bulk it, wank it. No, I got I got a shower, yeah. No, I didn't uh, I don't know how he managed that one. Um he's a he's a good looking boy, so he probably doesn't smell as bad. So, yeah. <laughs> um so uh, carrying on that sort of theme, um we always ask, uh what's the biggest or best prank or practical joke that you've been involved with? It doesn't have to be to you, you mm. could have done it to somebody else. Oh geez, uh, biggest best practical prank. Um, I've seen. Uh, I don't wanna, not naming. I'm not going to name too many names. Yeah, go on, name names, man. <laughs> name names. <laughs> because a little bit. I've uh, I've seen uh, uh, one player I played with um, who met a girl who he thought he met a girl at Gatwick Airport who was we on our way to an away game and. Uh, he was obviously giving it the big one. He was quite young at the time, um, and giving it the big one, saying, "Look, I uh, really like this girl. I'm going to chat her up, whatever." So she wasn't too interested. So she went. Up, he went away, came back, and we'd given. We spoke to the girl and said, "Look, he's going to ask you for your number. Um, just give him this number. That's all you need to do." So she was like, <laughs> "Perfect." perfect. So uh, we went back to the lad and like, "Oh God, mate, I think I think she's keen on you." He's like, "Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I think she's definitely keen on you. Definitely." Go on, go ask her for your number. So, true to form, she perfectly, oh, wait there, let me get a pen and paper, hand him over this number. Oh. And for the next couple of days, he was sending this, who he thought was this girl, who's actually our latest over, overseas Australian sign in every sort of picture and detail of everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a, a blind though. We were, on the, we were on the bus having played the game. We stayed out that, I uh, know we didn't, we just had played the game on the Saturday, flew back to Gatwick that night. And we'd organise, like, look, as this this young lady to um, bring your mates, I'll meet you in London. So he's on the phone organising, getting his her mates, getting sorted. He got his mum, pick him up early from Gatwick. Um, <laughs> and we were going to do a collage. Did you want me to take him on the date as well? No, we were going to do a collage of our best, uh, our best photos and the best things he'd sent us for the team meeting on Monday morning. But um, unfortunately, um, our head coach got wind of it and said, Whilst this is absolutely brilliant and hilarious, this also could be quite legally <laughs> sensitive. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Whatever. we'll see that in your autobiography in a few years' time. Um, maybe, maybe <laughs> under, yeah. So, uh, that was quite a good one. Yeah. Oliver, um, who's the toughest opponent you've ever played against? Who's the best opponent? Um, 
Um, it's kind of, it's, I think it's kind of hard to sort of talk about one individual opponent because I think all players have got their skills and their, their tricks that you think, like, so in terms of like footwork, someone like Snotty Snotty, you can't lay a hand on. Um, he could step you in a phone box. But then, so coming through the age groups, um, I was, well, lucky enough or unlucky enough to have Billy Van Apollo in my position. So um, when you go, uh, you go, right, we're going to do some tackling practice and get on, um, get sort of man on man. And you've got 21 stone Billy at 17 or however old he was at the time. Uh, I was quite interested in yeah. I think actually the best rugby player in terms of brain and all-round skill for me would be um, would be Jimmy Gropeth. I thought Jimmy Gropeth was just a different level to play with. Um, had he not been a Kiwi, he'd probably have 50, 60, 70, 100 international caps. Um, what he sees in the game and what he can do, I think, is just absolutely fantastic. So he'd definitely be up there for sure. Oli, I'm just going to um, ask, what was your, um, you sort of, I was going to ask about what was your favourite game, but I think you've already touched on that with uh, sort of winning the championship with um, London Welsh. Um, but what about, did you have a favourite ground or a favourite away side to go and play um, at all in, in the championship? Uh, in the championship, ooh. but I think it's a tough one because you get obviously you get some of the grounds that, <laughs> to put it lightly, are shitholes, but they're also quite endearing. Um, like going down with pirates and it's freezing cold and change rooms are wet and it's tough and it's minging, but it's actually quite a good sort of good place to play rugby. I think probably the best place in the championship, in my opinion, to play rugby. I think uh, not being biased, I think Doncaster when Doncaster's busy and. Um, Donny doing well, which is sort of a big difference. The years we were sort of doing well up in the league. Um, it's a good place to play rugby. It's a big pitch. The crowds are really good and quite vocal, like, like most Yorkshiremen are. Um, I imagine as referees, they let you know when you get a decision wrong. Um, never, yeah. never, mate. <laughs> no, yeah. I, do, I do remember one of my first exchange games, which is to Huddersfield YMCA, and that's... The oh, pitch Jesus is so Christ. big. It, yeah, it's it's such a big pitch. It's yeah. one end of a different time zone. And it's got a microclimate. And I remember I was about nine minutes in the game and I've got my arm up like this for another offside. And all I heard was, it's all right, lads, his arm will get tired and fucking drop off in a minute. Sounds <laughs> 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 about right. I've, I've been, I've been yeah, I mean, that, yeah, nine minutes into the game. But, I mean, it was tempered right at the beginning. So my assessor came in didn't do any sort of preview or anything, just gave me a radio to wear. And he says, now listen here, lad, there are a bunch of cheeky bastards up here, right? <laughs> See you after the game. And he walked back in afterwards. And, I, you know, it's drizzle as it normally is up there. And I, I'm soaking wet. And like, what has just happened to me for 80 odd minutes? He walked, knocked on the door, walked in, went, told you they were fucking cheats, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Yorkshire rugby. Yeah, I well, love it. Rugby's like that. When you go around the grounds, I was lucky enough to play uh, on loan as a kid at Otley, and you play like the local games. Oh, it's Wolf, lovely. Wolf down places like that, and to put parties on, you've got sort of sixty and seventy year old farmers saying every word in the bloody book at you, and it's it's actually fantastic. It's kind of sort of grassroots, real real rugby. Yeah, I did a game at Keithley and. Uh, I had the misfortune to have to send somebody off after four minutes. Uh, I, I, it, it, it was a no, I, I had no choice. He just come running straight in, head first, and put the top of his head in somebody's chin. And he and I went. I blown the whistle, and he said, "Passes for a tackle up there. They just follow." Um, uh, no, you know, no. It was. It was. It was. It, he stood over him, and he said, "I told you two seasons ago, I'd fucking get you, and I fucking got you." <laughs> 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 I mean, I've got nowhere. Streets, isn't it? Yeah, you've got nowhere. You've absolutely got nowhere to go. <laughs> the thing, the old video, uh, the video catches you out. I've been fell foul of it a couple of times, and uh... I was just going to ask, what's uh, what's the worst one you've been caught with? Oh, what was the worst? I've, I've been in front of the traditionals a couple of times. I got, I got, I got done this season for a punch, which was three weeks for good behaviour. Um, actually. The first, the first time playing, first season of playing men's rugby, I was playing for my local home club, which is Westo, up in South Shields. And we were playing against Stockport. And we were just, I think we, we were... Ooh, maybe, Stockport. I think we, I think we were not <laughs> two yet. I think we were one, we were level below, which at the time might have been Northeast one, I think, which was a rough, rough old league, like full sort of 30-man brawls most weeks. And I actually, uh, playing there, I got... Um, 
someone grabbed my grabbed me by the nuts. So I sort of left it, whatever. Happened again the second time. And so I came in at half time. I said to the referee, look, like this is happening. Either you've got to deal with it or I have. And about five minutes in the second half, first sort of rock we'd kind of gone to because there'd been a few scrums. He's done it again. I've just hit him as hard as I could. Straight reds. I think I was, I was supposed to get uh, 12 weeks, but because I was sort of a 17-year-old and sort of explained my situation, they, uh, I think they reduced it down to two. So I got away. Oh, that's, a, that's a let-off, mate. That's, yeah, well, yeah, I mean... The, yeah, you you did well there, son. You did yeah. you did damn well there. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> the, the old northeast leagues, I think they kind of uh, there wasn't too many sort of um, reviews or. or... Mm. Uh, what well, on that sort of doesn't have to necessarily be championship. Could be could be any club really. But what was your favourite club to play for for whatever reason? <sighs> it's an interesting one. I mean, sort of every club's had its had its um, had its positive sides. I mean, like going and playing for Falcons as my home club. Um, so it's like a big one. I think the, se- the season we had at London Welsh, uh, the year went up, was probably the best season in terms of personally how much I enjoyed rugby. We had a really good culture, a good set of lads. I think um, London Welsh, having come down the season before, a lot of players left and we were sort of all sort of pieced together last minute. We had a new head coach come in, new coaching staff. And I think it was kind of old school rugby. Justin Bernal got it really right in terms of, I mean, we went on the piss every week. Uh, just if I mean Justin's a big drinker himself, so he was on the piss most nights. Um, and we all sort of stuck together. It's like our show, actually, that does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, kind of we, uh, we had a big full of pack, which kind of put me down the grounds. Um, and we went uh, everywhere, and no, sort of no one expected us to do the things we did because Bristol was so good and, and what have you. Um, I think that that year was pretty special. And then also the year the year we got to the farm with Doncaster as well which was even more a case of we came out of nowhere. I think the season before we finished 10th or 9th or really low down. And to finish second that year was pretty, uh, was pretty special as an achievement. On that then, I'm guessing that uh, I can't quite remember back myself, but was it in, in the, um, the playoffs at the end of the championship that you beat um, Bristol to go up then, I, I'd imagine? Um, so do you, think that, that, do you think the playoffs were a good thing? Or do you think that it's now that automatic first team the, the, the winners go straight back up to the Prem? Yeah, it's a difficult one because unless the leagues can be funded equally, um, I don't think it should be first past the post. Um, you have the teams coming down with parachute payments of however many, I think it used to be three or three and a half million and the rest of the league was getting just more than that between the 11 sides. So if they're going to fund the league equally um, to whatever amount that will be, then I think first past the post should be, should be the way. However, they refused to, the powers that be, and the playoffs were the sort of leveller, which allowed mm-hmm. the sort of lesser sides a, a bite of the cherry and say, well, you might have X, Y and Z internationals, but you've got to beat us twice here. And we're not necessarily going to play to the rules in terms of we're not going to play beautiful rugby and we're going to make it as difficult as possible. And I think that, that sort of leveled things up for a while. Um, mm-hmm. But now, I mean, essentially the team that comes down gets put on the naughty step for a season and then sent straight back. <laughs> Naughty step. Uh, it was definitely a good focal point as well. I think for for the limited coverage that Sky Sports had of the championship. Yeah. I, mean, I remember. I think it was when, when Bristol came up and they were playing Ealing. I think it was in there. I think if I remember rightly, but it was it was a really good sort of spectacle to watch because actually it really got loads of people out to the games. Yeah, um, real focus yeah. point. End of the season, big push. And also, I think the problem is, so if you get a team like Newcastle last year, so dominant, I think they beat Ealing uh, just before Christmas. The season was done then. Um, in terms of there's probably three or four teams looking over their shoulder relegation rise. And then the other seven teams in the league were thinking, well, I mean, we want to finish a bit higher for a bit of personal pride and what have you. But relatively, the season's finished. Whereas I remember there's quite a few games where it was sort of the last sort of two or three games of the season in this two till seven or eight in the league could get into the playoffs and they were sort of really big pivotal games which actually generated a bit of momentum and a bit more interest yeah. from fans and TV yeah. and everything else um, and it kept it as a competition whereas now it's, it's nearly a foregone conclusion what's going to happen unfortunately Yeah, we were talking before about um, players when they come to the end of their career where yeah. they go back or do they go back or do they just walk away from the, from the, the game 
thinking of your situation, if you're still up in Yorkshire, have you spoken to your former coach, Mr. Davis, the mag magnificent Welshman? No. Who is at Leeds, because he is recruiting. Uh, I missed, I actually missed Phil Davis. When I, uh, when I first joined Leeds in the academy, I think Phil had just left off the back of win the Power Gen Cup and what have you, and, um, and uh, Stuart Lancaster taking over. But uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen with Leeds at the minute. It's, um, it's a real shame what's happened to the club, unfortunately. Um, yeah. I, I, obviously, when I sort of came through as a kid, you, sort of, you saw the back of the Power Gen Cup winning team. You saw pretty much half of the future England squad were Yorkshiremen and, and sort of coming through that route. Yeah. And it looked like a really sort of positive and, and good time to be around. And unfortunately, for, I mean, well-publicised reasons, um, the club sort of dwindled away, which is a massive shame. I saw, I was going to say, would you consider going back there for next season? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what their situation is. So I'm, as I say, I'm open to any offers of where I'm going to play next year, but um, I'm not sure what, what position leads are in. Or um, I, I'd give I'd give Phil a call just maybe. to see. Cause I, 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 <laughs> He's on the show next week if you want to dial in again. <laughs> you can ask him. <laughs> no, I mean, to be, to be fair, I mean, we were talking about how Sandbach, uh, or I was talking about how Sandbach lost 10 or 11 players of a youth team mm. uh, to, to sail. And you'll have played against all these guys, the Liam Alix, the Will Cliffs, uh, the James Has uh, Gaskells uh, of this world. And they all came from, from Sandbach. And if they, now at their end of their careers, decided to go back to Sandbach to help them in whatever way, that would make Sandbach so much stronger. Yeah, um, it, would be. it would be for sure. I think, it, I think it's a very like idolised sort of, I do. I guess obviously situations are different where boys are living in the country, or whether they relocate back to where their home is, or like I personally, I'm from South Shields, and I mean job opportunities in the northeast are, aren't necessarily the strongest at times. So whilst I'd love to go back and play for my own club, West, that would be be fantastic. I think we're in uh, Northumberland, Durham, one now or something. You go um, play for good to play for Huddersfield YM. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I've played one game at Huddersfield YM, and I think that was enough. Um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to take a short break, uh, but we'll be talking to, uh, to Ollie some more uh, right after this break. Uh, welcome back to part three of the 22 Dropouts. Yes, we are a YouTube show. Yes, we are a podcast, but you know that already. No, we're not sponsored by Guinness. No, we're not sponsored by Harry's, which is why we don't talk about them all that often. But if saying Guinness, Guinness, Guinness and Harry's, Harry's, Harry's means that they're going to sponsor us, then why the hell not? Um, so there you go, marketing men. We will say your name whenever you like if you uh, want to sponsor the show. Um, now, we've heard tonight from, uh, from Ollie uh, about uh, all the things that he's been through uh, and uh, his opinions on the, uh, the championship uh, structure and things like that. Um, as we talked earlier, Ollie at the moment hasn't got any, uh, any deals for next year. So if you're a director of rugby, and you're looking for a, a class at number eight, um, we'll make sure there's a link to his show reel on here as well. Get my we'll, script we'll and live Twitter on there. Yeah, yeah, um, but we will miss out that dump tackle that we all think you should have got a yellow card for. Um, <laughs> more of that later on if we get time on tonight's show. We might, we might talk about that. Um, so, Ali, what is going through your mind at the moment, uh, given the, 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 the fact that the, the contract in France has fallen through, um, what are your thoughts now? Where are you thinking? Are we thinking rugby outside of rugby? What's um, what's going through your mind? Well, I think it's an interesting one. It's just sort of a time of um, assessing all sort of options and, and what's available out there, whether that be staying in full time rugby or, or, or semi pro or or leaving rugby altogether. Um, I think obviously the whole world's in a bit of a mess right now. Um, it's slowly sort of recovering, and rugby's. Uh, being hit as hard as sort of any industry is at the minute. So the opportunities aren't necessarily there as, as what they were before. And, and certainly the money, um, as we've seen with, with the budget cuts and the, the salary cap reductions, isn't, um, isn't quite what it used to be. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting time having a lot of conversations with a lot of different people and, uh, and what the, uh, the ideas are and the options to me moving forward, which um, still remain very much open. So what sort of areas, if it isn't, going to be in rugby or you've got to find something else as well as rugby 
what sort of areas do you want to work in? Well, it's an interesting one because obviously uh, joining sort of joining Leeds Academy at 16, I've never actually worked a, a real day yet, which is uh, <laughs> some people would set quite a skill at 29 to get that far, I think. Um, uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of open to a lot of suggestions. I, I managed to do my degree uh, through the RPA, which was um, business management and leadership. So I think there's a lot of sort of transferable skills. I think generally a lot of rugby players have a lot of skills that are very useful to a lot of companies. Um, Definitely. Which, which might not necessarily be sort of the, the generic sort of CV skills, but actually I think a lot of things that rugby players have to go through and, and deal with um, makes them a lot more hard and a lot more uh, sort of worthy of, of the sort of conventional roles in, in business. Yeah, we talk about this all the time. And, um, you know, the, the consultancy that we own works with a lot of rugby guys. And we always say, forget the CV. I'm not interested in people uh, in, in terms of just getting a model. Uh, uh, you know, another Barbie doll is just the same as the last Barbie doll yeah. or the action man of Ken or whatever. Let's break that mold and let's, you know, you talk about transferable skills. I also see some massive resilience within sporting, well, particularly, I have to say, in rugby. Um, you know, sometimes you're, you're knee deep in, in research, you're trying to outthink, outsmart somebody, you're trying to get all the information that you possibly can, so you can get your head down when you need to, you can work hard when you need to, you can change your mind and your decision making at, uh, at the click of a finger as well. Yeah, very much so. I think um, people sort of underestimate their, their worth as rugby players. Um, I think the, the abilities that a lot of rugby players possess and as you say, the, the, this kind of stuff that goes on behind the scenes, most rugby players now spend more time in meeting rooms than they do on the pitch um, and the, sort of the in-depth analysis and, and, and things that go on behind the scenes before you get to an 80-minute game at the weekend is what, is what makes the game. So I think a lot of those skills are very transferable and, and a lot of rugby players can talk very well. A lot of them are very personal, um, personal, personable. And, um, and generally likable characters, which I think, especially in business from my sort of limited experience, I think if you're, if you're a good bloke first and foremost, or you're an interesting character, it's a lot easier to, a lot easier to, um, to transition. And what sort of sectors have you, uh, have you looked into? Uh, and what, what sort of areas of the country? Well, it's, it's only been quite recently um, that this sort of fell through. It was only last week. So I've kind of been, as I said, having a lot of conversations with a lot of different people. Um, my degree was business management, so looking at all sorts of types of uh, business, whether that's sort of um, performance improvement and enhancement or um, general professional uh, professional solutions and skills. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of open um, to find out what what I like and what I'm what I'm good at or what I'm not so good at. Probably will be the first thing I'll find out and um, and go from there. I think one of the things about rugby players, though, is even if you don't like it, you don't like getting up early, you don't like doing a bronco no. test, you don't no. like working hard in the drizzle and no. the frost uh, doing contact sessions, but you have to do it and you understand that and you have this never say die, never give up attitude. Yeah, I, th I think also for a lot of rugby players, a lot of people say, well, you're very fortunate to have your job, which, which you are, but the amount of people who can't be motivated to even go to the gym or go, go for a run, and it's like, come do that every day when you've got 20 Stone Islanders running at you or uh, you get on the Watt bike or you're on whatever. And it's, for some guys, that, that's easy. I mean, the, the sort of scraps and the flaps, the, the fit guys, it's easy. But when you're 19 Stone, having to lug that up and down every day, um, <laughs> can, can be a bit, of a bit of a drag sometimes. I think, the word, I think the word is tenacity. I think most rugby players have got a tenacity. Uh, that you don't always see in the workplace from somebody going from university into the workplace into senior management positions you don't see that tenacity and I played uh, rugby I've refereed for nearly 20 years I played the other rugby game and got paid for it you've still got to put the hours in we were semi-pro back in the 80s and semi-pro meant you got 25 quid if you were lucky for winning pay and you got a tenner if you got losing pay and that didn't include the number of stitches you'd end up with because it, it was just a different game. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's very, very interesting. Also, road players have to deal with, well, from day one, sort of dealing with like winning and losing and, and when times are bad. Because if, if you're not performing as a rugby player, you're soon out, soon out of work and you're soon out of a job, which um, I think, especially going into a, a traditional job setting, I think being able to work under, under that sort of pressure, um, I can't imagine sort of directors and and board members and managers in normal business talking to you the way that some of my uh some of my former coaches and some of their <laughs> choice language 
this, uh, uh, Mr. Griffiths. Yeah, you get sacked in business for doing that. Well, yeah, you'd think so. But in rugby, it seems to be a, like a, a positive character traits of most head coaches and DORs, well, especially the sort of old school ones where. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. How, how did you find Griff to work with? Because Griff is a great coach. He's an interesting bloke, isn't he? He's, uh, he's, he's very yeah. funny, very, very witty. Um, I mean, the first time I was at Doncaster, what he did uh, with that group of boys was, was fantastic, um, taking us from sort of 10th. And we, did, we, we certainly weren't the best team in the league, very, very much far from it, but um, sort of galvanising the squad and togetherness and, and all the boys enjoying it. With, he had uh, Glenn Kenworthy and Paul Cook, who are both fantastic as well. Um, the sort of second time as a Doncaster is a very, very difficult situation. I think for Clive, with sort of one eye on on retirement or or sort of stepping down and the yeah. sort of switching that went on, it was a very, very um, difficult season for for myself and for Clive well, for a lot of us. He'd also had a heart attack, hadn't he? Which didn't. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's not many people I know who, after after 40 years or 50 years of rugby and having a heart attack at a game, would be back in rugby. Um, and the doctors, I think, from what I understand, were saying to him, "Look, maybe it's time to have a chill." But I mean, you try, try, try. No, the first time I I met him was many, many years ago in rugby league. Uh, mm. But then he, I was in Wales, uh, refereeing in North Wales, and he ran RGC, and he took them from being a bunch of non-performing uh, guys who played the odd representative game mm. to playing and winning. Uh, championship games and, and, and going all the way up into the Prem but um, he, he builds uh, I don't know if he's still doing it but he used to build all these games on defence defence wins games is his mantra yeah that's his uh, that's, that's sort of Clive's sort of forte was his defence coach and I think as he got older he kind of um, allowed sort of assistant coaches to sort of take things but he's still very much um, very much hot on his defence and you can guarantee if you lost on a Saturday first thing Monday morning the stats would come up of how many tackles did we make how many line breaks did they they sort of they gain on us and he certainly uh, run the right act if we didn't defend very well yeah does he still shout no no uh, no injuries in defense <laughs> no <laughs> shout a lot if Clive <laughs> puts himself at the top of the balcony um at Donny and you can still hear him bellowing and going crazy and yeah he's still uh very passionate so he's there if I can um jump in straight to what uh, you you guys were discussing is that probably any aspect um, that you've come across to your, your span of playing for Doncaster, um, based on a referring perspective that maybe they need to change or rather they need to up, up, upgrade their skills. Who's, who's that, referees? Um, I think, I mean, I wouldn't be a referee. You couldn't pay me enough money to be a referee, first and foremost. <laughs> Um, we don't get paid <laughs> so, uh, it's a very very tough job and regardless what you do someone's going to have an opinion on what you're doing and someone's not going to like what you're doing um, I think sort of the move since throughout my career of referees going away from the traditional you'll do as you're told and if you don't like it you're back 10 which I think there's still an element of but I think generally um, the inclusion of talking to players and, and discussing decisions while still maintaining the element of respect, which I think rugby's fantastic for and it, and it keeps hold of. Um, but I think talking to players as a, as a referee is vital because I think you'll get less penalties that way as a ref. I think players will be more on your side, be more inclined to work with you. I think the minute you get the old school referees, I'm, I'm not going to name any names of, there's still a few in the background. <laughs> Just in case you've still got a rugby career, <laughs> I, I could, could yeah. they've already penalised me enough, so I'm not. It's not can't get too much. Um, but the old school referees who I'll talk to the captain only, and if I hear any chat, there'll be yellow cards thrown out, and it's just. I think that sort of generation of rugby is kind of going. As I said, the respect what? just going to be there. What Sorry. do you think about all of this appealing? So we, we as referees, um, certainly within England had uh, a huge, as you, as you know, had a huge clampdown on this appealing. And they're always nines. With, it looks like yeah. the, it's a taxi with the door o- doors open because they've all got big ears. They're all and, awesome. and they're always, they're always <laughs> doing this. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and it, it, I'll tell you what, it drives us nuts because it just takes everything away from the game. Well, yeah, nobody likes to scrum out, firstly, that most of them are arseholes that I've met so far. 
Um, yeah, put it there, man. We like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think, firstly, it's a good nine should be doing that. Um, a, a vocal nine can influence the game massively. And, and you always say the old cliche that sort of a lot of scruffs think they referee the game, which they do. Um, a, a lot of good nines will, um, will influence the referee. But I've, I've got no problems with referees penalising and appealing. I think players, when, when you're competitive, it's almost impossible not to sort of say, well, come on, say you missed that, which referees do miss things. Uh, touch judges miss things. It, it happens. Um, but I think, obviously, it, referees, as I said before, if, if they talk to players, it probably alleviates a little bit of that. Um, and if it does get too much, then, yeah, just overturn decisions, back 10, and it soon stamps it out. And if, if you have to, then you have to go to the pocket. But... Uh, but yeah, we can't account for most scrums. You get a few mouthy ones. Nah, no, I'm so glad with, you agree with me on that. So, so with that, who's the best referee that's refereed you? Um, <laughs> trying to think. Uh, I mean, I, I've been fortunate to have a few referees. <laughs> I haven't had, <laughs> I've had Nigel Owens actually. Never had Nigel Owens, so I can't talk to Nigel. But he does do a fantastic job on the on the TV. You see him. Wayne Barnes was brilliant. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to, Wayne Barnes lives sort of around the corner from London Welsh, so we had him a few times. Uh, he actually came in and gave a, a talk um, at the end of season two, where he started with a montage of his worst refereeing decisions, which was fantastic. Um, able to laugh at himself, and he's made some absolute howlers. He was very good. Um, I'm trying to think, think a few. Uh, Luke Pierce is pretty good. Uh, he talks very Another well. Another Welshman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, there's the man from Manchester. Not even yeah, that. Old corn. There's oh. a few the old school referees, sort of Tim Rigglesworth. He's very much the old school sort of, this is the way we're going to do it and I'm going to referee the game this way. And if you don't like it, then you're going to spend some time off the pitch, which is, uh, at least you know where you stand with those sort of guys. Not necessarily the most forthcoming of referees, but you know exactly what you're going to get and what you're not going to get, which I think is, consistency is obviously massive for, for the player. Um, if you're going to be crap, be crap for everyone. Uh, and if, if you're going to be good, then happy days, no problems with it. A oh, question from uh, one of our absent 22. Um, so Chris uh, isn't with us this week. He's been working. But he wants to know, what's the most difficult part of being a professional rugby player? Uh, pre-season fitness, I'd say, would be up there for sure. <laughs> yeah, same as me. You don't have to be a professional. Yeah. You don't have to be a professional for that one. <laughs> yeah, I think when you, um, I think when you turn up on the first day and part of you thinks, oh, I've had a good pre, I've had a good off season, I've been all right, and then you see the sort of the yo-yo test being set up with the Bronco, and you remember every bad meal you've eaten, every drink you've had, and <laughs> for for a big bloke, for a nineteen stone guy, pre season isn't the most fun. So I think, I think the toughest thing rugby is as a rugby player is sort of the emotional highs and lows. Um, when things are good, rugby's fantastic. Uh, when things are bad, it, it's as a, as a sort of road player, which most road players are quite selfish. We, we're all sort of internalised and we focus on ourselves. When things are going bad, it, it does feel like the end of the world. Um, mm. I think sort of co contract negotiation times always tough. I mean, well, for some boys, it's probably not. If you're growing Farrell or Maratoji, it's probably a fantastic time. But um, if you're sort of in the championship or the bottom end of the premiership, it would be very tough times. I think. Um, for me, I've found when, when coaches have, have left clubs, uh, that's, that's been a very tough time when you sign for a coach and they've either left up to, to take better jobs or the, the board have seen a different direction and you, you, you sort of bring, they bring someone else in. And it's, it's a very um, precarious time for a couple of weeks where you're sort of figuring out, does he like me? Is he, is he going to fancy the way I play or does he want to do something else? And I think that can be emotionally very tough. Um, and obviously things I think like I'm sure the boys at Gloucester are feeling at the moment. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, yeah. Uh, giving to move in. I think the, the Sips has already tweeted out saying, really looking forward to it, really support him. And be interesting to know whether that is a, a full whole, wholehearted thing or whether that was yeah. not sure on a, his good side early. Yeah, I'm not sure that's a looking forward or looking back situation. That could be uh, could be the one, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it's uh, for the positive. But yeah, I think selection's a very tough thing. Um, everyone's had periods where they've been dropped and you've had, sometimes coaches talk to you and say, okay, yeah, this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at something different this weekend, sort of horses for quarters and you say, oh, yeah, I can take that on the chin. And then you get some coaches say, well, look, that's, that's what I think and that's the way it is and get better. Uh, that can be uh, very emotionally difficult to deal with at times, I think. 
Well, no, just before we so. move on to tonight's rumour mill, we want to be introduced to your teddy bear over your right shoulder. Because he's sort of teddy picking bear. out from your shelf and we uh, think he should come and say hello. No, no definitely not. It's old. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Go and get your You're teddy, busted. Ollie. No, I can't. I've not been there for about 20 years, unfortunately. So, no, that's... Uh, I'm in my parents' house, so unfortunately I... Uh, I can't be. Oh, <laughs> go and get your mum. We want the baby photos. <laughs> I was, I was even uglier back then, so no, we can't be doing that. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's about time we moved on to the next part of the show, which is our trusted rumour mill. And again, we're going to put you on the spot, mate, because it's always down to the guest to provide us with the most hip hop and happening rugby rumour that you've received to date. Uh, as in what's happening right now? Uh, uh, any rumours you've heard? Rumor. Who's moving? Who's moving where and what? Um, I'm not sure. No, I, we don't already know. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, well, I think, I think a lot of things are kind of up in the air still. As we said before with the market, um, there's a lot of players who haven't decided their futures, from what I understand. So there's still a few, few Saris boys that are, I believe, looking elsewhere, but not to, I'm not sort of in the, the personal of that. I can't think of anything that comes to mind that, is big that's gonna no there's nothing I, I can't think anything comes to mind that's big that's gonna be sort of moving i think most people have been, most people have been announced who are going and there's a lot of players who are with the with the restart of next season i see jamie gibson today's announced that he's leaving northampton which is a pretty interesting one yeah. but yeah i think there's a lot of boys who are still very unsure because of the season restarting and i think there's gonna be a lot of moves happening very late if there is uh gonna be happening so yeah, yeah, I don't think Gibson's going uh, is staying in rugby either. I think he's looking now at other no. opportunities. He's a bright boy. I, I believe he's Oxford educated or Cambridge or UTL or something like that. He's a bright lad from what I understand, so I'm sure he's uh, got enough things lined up. So, um, you've, you've ruined it with the teddy bear and the baby photos. Yeah, you've ruined the rumour mill because you don't have one. <laughs> no. um, James, that... James, dig us out of the hole of the rumour mill, man. Oh, well. Um, according to one of my sources, who was very accurate last week, incidentally, uh, AWJ, as in Alan Wynn, mm. is um, both Bristol and Tigers are looking to sign him. Well, I know Tigers are looking for a second row, so that does make sense. Very much makes sense. How tall are you? Can you play second no. row? No, unfortunately, I haven't got the work <laughs> ethic, I don't think. <laughs> stick, stick my head in, I haven't got the heart to stick my head in between those arses all day. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> it's worse when they, it's scoop. worse when they've had a curry the night before, man. Oh, I'd imagine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, some of the creatures I've played with, like people like Colin Quigley, it's just not a place you want to be. Like it's just he doesn't shout, he doesn't shout at the times. So yeah, it's not. A place oh, nice. <laughs> so uh, James, which one do you think he'll go for? If he goes anywhere. Um, He'll probably go for Tigers because, although he's a Welsh boy through and through and a Valleys boy, um, I suspect he'll be better placed for uh, potentially Lions, but uh, even carrying on with Wales, he'd be better placed with Tigers than Bristol. Although Bristol's closer to home. Yeah, he could, he could just fly over the bridge and be at Bristol, couldn't he? Yeah. No, the yeah. thing is, they could Bristol afford it? I mean, the, the oh, amount of people they're getting on board at the moment is just yeah. insane. They can definitely afford it, whether it's legal or not. Be well, it's, yeah. It's, <laughs> within the, within the, whether they do a Saris or not. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Well, they assure the everybody it's all underneath the cap, so we'll have to oh, wait well. and see. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure, yeah. Which, whichever side he did, if he did go, whichever side he went to, they would benefit from it because yeah, he's yeah. probably the one of the biggest workhorses in, in rugby in the second row um, and a great guy as well. I think, especially for a club like Leicester, who've been in a seemingly a little bit of turmoil the last few years, I think bringing in a sort of person like Halloween with his leadership, I mean, you, you give him the captain's armband straight away and say, look, you've got to say, take us forward here yeah. type thing. Um, yeah, somebody to steady the ship that everybody can look towards. Yeah. I know I know he's old, but he's still got a good few miles left in him, so I, I wouldn't, I'd say that's a very shrewd sign if Leicester managed to pull that one off. So James is putting his money where? Bristol or Leicester? No, I think, I think it'll be Leicester. I think it'll be Tigers. If he does go anywhere, it'll be to a club where he's got a chance of making a, a big difference. And yeah, I think Tigers, a big Tigers, Tigers, small over there. I think Tigers is the place where he'll make the most difference. 
I agree with that, yeah. What about you then, Lawrence? What have you heard this week? What's, what rumours are there f- founding in Kenya? I mean, there must be loads, mate, obviously. Definitely one is that I'm vying for the um, head coach job at the Kenya Sevens. That's not a rumour. That's, that's a fact that you've applied for it. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, maybe if I, make, if I make it a rumour, then I may be the next head coach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Start the gossip. Again, but, uh, two scoops okay, tonight. Right. You heard it here no. first. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, okay. I, that'll, be, that'll be a party night, and all your outtakes, all of your bloopers talking about the colour and size of your cock, they will all come <laughs> out and they will be all over the seven series, mate. In fact, they're all over. They're all over YouTube already. <laughs> just to just to just to qualify that. No, Ollie. leave it there. Leave it there. I'll let Ollie worry. <laughs> Ollie worry. Oh, okay. He does. But keep on, on a serious note, on a serious note, is that um, uh, London London Irish have filed a sort of uh, they are seeking legal action. Um, they are alleging that. Uh, the new head coach who signed in by Gloucester, um, that there was a breach of contract uh, during the signing in of um, new head coach. And so probably in the new, next uh, few weeks, few days, we may be seeing uh, legal action being taken uh, because that's a breach of the premiership um, regulations. Yeah, I know. And we talked about it at the very beginning of the show. There's been no complaint yet to the, uh, uh, to the PRL, but that doesn't mean to say there isn't going to be one. I think, um, I don't know, do you want to go down that route? Or should you just let Sleeping Dogs lie and crack on with what you've got to crack on with? It's an interesting one, isn't it? It's in terms of, um, I mean, as, as, a, as a board of directors, I'd feel very, uh, very pissed off that my, one of my coaches has left. So it will make another club who's a rival stronger. So, I mean, if it was in football... Yeah, they didn't want to let him go. No, exactly. So who knows? Yeah, well, we'll wait and see on that one. Uh, Tom, come on, you must have a rumour. Yeah, I have. Um, it, it, it's only sort of in the potentially in the pipe work for the future, but uh, obviously Dan Carter's recently signed back with the Blues back in New Zealand. Uh, but it's rumoured at the moment that Quinns are looking to sign him for the 2021 season um, on a short-term contract when he's finished with yeah. the Blues to kind of give them a little bit of boost teach a little bit to uh, young Marcus Smith whether that's going to really happen or not that's a a a big debate to have I think there but it's uh, something that's been rumoured at the moment the RFU might be uh, might be checking up on the salary cap for that one Jesus it won't be cheap will it it might be a might be a fall in for four weeks maybe uh, his usual price (laughs) but then you look at the Quinns at the moment I mean you know arguably their biggest sort of marquee player you could say in Carl Sinclair's uh, obviously off to Bristol so who really is, is is their big marquee player at the moment you could say Marla perhaps but he's their really only big England player that's left at the moment um, um, the rest of them are all X or potentially future Marcus Smith and Ibertoy obviously yeah well Ibertoy is apparently off to um, Argen isn't he from all yeah, accounts I've heard that too yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't blame him for a couple of years before you get ready to play for England. I mean, it'd be a great place to learn how to play rugby in the top fourteen. So, and um, I, I think last year when he played against uh, Claremont, maybe he dished them up and scored a couple. So, you talk about the twenty twenty one season. Um, if we ever get anywhere with uh, the twenty twenty season, is it, it yeah. comes first. And on that, um, so there've been a few rumours. We, we've had the return to play. Um, roadmap and traffic light system and things like that. So we know what paths we need to go down. We're just not sure when we're going to start going down them. Um, but something that uh, I, that I heard today was that um, rugby below the championship will not start until January. Um, now there's people planning for September, October, November, December. There's lots of contingencies, particularly in that one, that two sides. But the, their reasoning was based on this, that if we start to, to finish off this current season uh, at the end of August, then we have to have a four or five week break. So the new season for the Premiership will not kick in until December. <clears throat> that will mean then for the, the Championship clubs, they will come straight into that as well. They will 
build up in, in sort of four or five weeks. Uh, they'll start playing again in, um, in December. There's not that much community rugby goes on in December anyway, depending where Christmas and New Year fall and things like that. So it, they're then looking to say, well, if they start in December, we'll get back to the, you know, the amateur game. Uh, and that one, that too, will start those in January. So there's still a lot of mileage to go on this. But because I, it would be, it'd be funny, wouldn't it, if all of a sudden you get two level eight clubs playing before the championship has even started? Yes, I don't see the reason hmm. why we delayed so long, um, providing that we don't see a second spike with COVID. Um, I mean, people have been out flocking for various reasons um, together and we haven't seen it yet. So I think the, the December or January start is, is crazy, in my opinion. Um, I don't see a reason why rugby can't safely return end of September, see, come October. Yeah, quite. See, I'm with you. I'm with you there, Ollie. I, I, my, I don't think they need four or five weeks break. They just had a bloody 12, 14 week break. They so the, don't premier, the Premiership, yeah, they, they will want to because you've got a lot of players moving, a lot of players going in and out of clubs. You've got some that Two are, weeks. as we found out last week, they are staying with their Premiership clubs, some of them, for, to finish this season. Some of them are moving to Championship sides as well. So you could argue that if, the, if that break period was reduced, and at the moment, that's still up for discussion um, with, within the contracts. Then those teams that are getting the, you know, Saris guys or other guys who are coming down into the championship um, and, and going to different teams around there, what, um, what impact is that going to have on them? How does that affect the club that they're going to go to? Are they better off? Are they worse off for that? So there has to be this break where everybody then can build up. But you just can't imagine, can you? Um, Two, two grassroots vets teams having it out on the pitch, but the championship isn't allowed to start yet. I could imagine that. I, I don't see the reason why the, why the premiership needs to restart. Essentially, we're going to drag out a season until September just to give someone a title. Um, I don't see the purpose of it. It's a purely a financial decision, in my opinion. And I don't see why we can't say, well, look, the season's finished or, or have whatever, even just have playoffs maybe. Maybe just have top four play each other and gone. I don't see a way that this whole global season, whilst it might happen at the elite level, the top level, I don't see how that's going to happen at amateur rugby where sort of like my local home club is split half cricket and half rugby. So come, yeah, come May the 1st, or no, actually that's not true, sorry. Um, actually, yeah, I think it's May the 1st, it's cricket season. And come September the 1st, it starts rugby season again. Um, and I think the clientele of rugby and those sort of sports are very similar. I don't see a way how that's going to really, really work other than TV. I think, it'll, I think any further delay past sort of mid to late September at the latest, I think it's going to hurt a lot of grassroots rugby clubs really hard because you will, yeah. get, you will get people who are not going to go back. You're going to get some oh, people cool. that aren't going to go back for various reasons because of the pandemic or they've just found something else to do or they're yeah. not in shape or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but definitely, definitely. I think also, especially with kids as well, I think um, yeah. kids have not played sport for, well, probably the best part of eight or nine months by the time this is over. How many of those are going to go back into playing grassroots sport and playing minis and juniors and age group sport when they've been sat around the whole time and maybe they've sort of lost the love for it or, or the want to play sport? So it could be a very precarious. And it's time. whether the parents want them to yeah. go back to it because of the, that risk as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, sadly, we've run out of time for tonight's show. It's been an absolute pleasure having Ollie join us. And of course, tonight, you're welcome to come back and keep us updated with, uh, with what happens, whether it's inside the rugby or outside the rugby. We'd be, we'd be really happy to, to, uh, to follow that journey with you. Um, now, don't forget, next week is uh, Dottie Weir's 50th birthday, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, on next week's show, we've got a special for Dottie's birthday. Um, you'll have to f- tune in next week to find out all the details, but it should be quite raucous given the guests that are coming on as well. Um, do go and check out our, um, our special interview with Jill Douglas that we did uh, a few weeks back about the Doddy Weir Foundation, and you can learn her most embarrassing moment of losing her underwear in front of the England rugby team. Just go and check out 22 Dropouts on, uh, on YouTube. Don't forget, if you're on social media, follow us, like us, and subscribe to us. Uh, go to at 22 Dropouts on Twitter, uh, Instagram, or Facebook. Um, make sure you like and subscribe to the show as well. Um, we'll see you all next week. 
Ollie, from us to you, thank you. It's been a pleasure. We'll see you again soon. Good night, everybody. Thank you, guys. Nasta. Cheers, Ollie.